بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هون As we have mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran إنا أنزلناه في ليلة القدر that the Quran was revealed in ليلة القدر ليلة القدر is in the month of Ramadan so that means there's a very strong connection with the Quran in the month of Ramadan so this is the month, if you want to establish a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best way to do it is to read the Qur'an. To have a conversation with Allah, to read the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Qur'an is the best thing. Because these words were uttered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah is giving us the honor to be able, he, when I say able, meaning Allah is giving us the ability to actually repeat the same exact words that were said by Allah to Jibreel to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And there's many miracles you find of the Quran too. Last year we had a speech about the miracles of the Quran, and these are just some encouragements to read the Quran too. When the Quran was revealed, it was, revealed, it was revealed as a miracle to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam left, this miracle still stayed. So this is the miracle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and there's many virtues and there's many ways you can look at the miracles of the Quran. Another point to mention before we call our next speaker: these are things to do to pre-prepare and before Ramadan too. Make a habit of reading Quran now too. Optional prayers now from now. Why, why, why do we have the, the 15th of Sha'ban to get us ready for the month of Ramadan? Another point that's mentioned was sincere repentance, tawbat al nasuha. When the month of Ramadan ends, as the hadith was mentioned, at the last day, the Prophet said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives all of your sins. The sins that is being referred to in this hadith is not our major sins. This is not referring to our major sins, it's referring to our minor sins. So the scholars say, before this month of Ramadan comes, that way, at the end of Ramadan, all of your sins are forgiven. Before this Ramadan starts, before the first of Ramadan, before that first night of Ramadan, we should have already made tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, begging Allah to forgive us for all of our sins. That tawbah al nasuha should have already been done. And just to give an example, Malana al-Shaykh Rumi rahimahullah wrote this very beautiful story about tawbah al nasuha. To give you an example of what tawbah al nasuha means. Sincere, sincere, sincere repentance. What does it mean? First of all, in order to repent, you have to acknowledge your faults. You have to say that I'm doing something wrong. So there's this person, his name was Nasuha. This person, his name was Nasuha. And he used to dress up as a girl. He was a man, he used to dress up as a girl. And in the old age, in the old times, they had a, you could say, not a bathroom like we do, a washroom, but they had an area for women for to take showers and stuff. So he, should go, he used to go there. One day the queen goes there too. And she loses her ring. So what happened? The guard rings the bell. And he says, the queen has lost her ring. Someone has stole her ring. So all the women come outside and line up. But he's a man. Now he's going to get caught. So he's very, very scared. So he's like the fourth or the fifth person. So they check the first person. No ring. They check the second person, no ring. And he's making the, oh Allah, please make sure one of these women have the ring because I don't want to get caught. And he's getting really scared. Third person, no ring. Fourth person, he's the next person. No, no, the third person happens, there's still no ring. The fourth person. And this man knows, now I'm going to get caught. I'm going to get caught. He's really scared. Imagine how scared he is at that time. And at that time, he makes such a dua. Oh Allah, I'll be a better person, I'll change, I'll be a righteous person. Just make sure the lady before me has the ring. And he makes that dua. Imagine how he was making that dua. Extremely scared, acknowledging what he has done wrong. He knows he's done something wrong. And he says to Ya Allah, I know I've done something wrong. Oh Allah, in from your infinite mercy, Ya Allah, please forgive me. And it just happened that fourth person had the ring. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved this person. So that's an example of Tawbat al nasuha Completely acknowledge our mistake, our faults, and then beg Allah, Oh Allah, I know I sinned. I know I've done something wrong. But Ya Allah, you're Ghafoor al-Rahim. You love to forget. What is it? Al-Wadud. Wahoo al-Ghafoor al-Wadud. It's so beautiful how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. 
Not only does he say, I forgive. But when Allah forgives, He completely wipes it off your slate, off your deeds, off your sins. He completely wipes it off. As if you never, as if you never did anything. You know, if someone does something wrong to us, and they ask us for forgiveness, they say sorry. No matter what you do, that thought will never leave your mind. This person did something for me. Next time I can't trust him. But Allah says, when I forgive you, I'm telling you how I forgive you. I forgive you as if you never did anything and I love you at the same time. When Allah says, when He says He loves you, He doesn't just say it like we do. But Allah is saying, I love you. And whatever you've done, I completely forgot it. So before this month of Ramadan, sincere repentance. Sincere repentance, that way at the end of Ramadan, all our minor sins are forgiven too, inshallah. So, now we have the month of Ramadan, we have these virtues, we have this, but we also have to know how to, how to do everything right too. We have to know the fiqh of Ramadan. Okay? This isn't to make anyone muftis and big faqis. This is just to get an understanding of Ramadan. Just to get an understanding of when our fast should begin, our end. How does our fast break if we accidentally eat and so on and so forth. How, how we should perform our fast in accordance to the teachings of Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, so if in th- this way, you, when you learn something new, you might have some other objections, some, some questions come to your mind too. So when we put it out there and present it, we'll give you a chance to ask questions too. So if you have any questions in mind, just mark it down. Inshallah, later on, we'll pass out the index cards. Without any further ado, I would like to call up Mufti Muhammad Jafri to start the first part of Fiqh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa al-aqibatu lil-muttaqeen, wa salatu wa salamu ala al-mab'uthi rahmatin lil-alameen, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi, wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawm al-deen, amma ba'd. Faqad qala Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala fi mahkamihi al-kitab al-kareem, wa kulu wa shrabu hatta ayatabayyana lakum al-khayt al-abyadu min al-khayt al-aswadi min al-fajr, sadaq Allah al-aliyya al-azim. Alhamdulillah, starting off with section 3, in regards to when we make intention of fasting, or when we are just about to start, learning of how we should make our suhoor, how we should make our iftar, and learning the correct manner of how a person should make intention before he fasts, and how he should, what he should do when he is making his suhoor, eating his suhoor, or breaking his fast. The Qur'an ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَضُ مِنَ الْخَيْطُ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that eat and drink until the white thread of light of dawn appears to you distinct from the black thread, meaning the darkness of the night. In the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when this ayah was first revealed, a sahabi, you know, he looked at the wordings of the ayah and he took it to its literal meaning. So he took a black thread and he took a white thread, and he put them beneath his pillow. He put them beneath his pillow. And then he said that when I can see the distinction between the white from the black, I'm going to make my fast, I'm going to start fasting. So this is the literal meaning that the Sahabi took. And then the Prophet ﷺ told him that this is not the meaning that the ayah is referring to, but it's referring to the time of dawn, that when the, white, and when the darkness of the night is being distinct from the whiteness or from the brightness of the, uh, the light of the day. Many of in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha reports that Bilal radiallahu ta'ala at that time used to do adhan. And Ibn Maktoum radiallahu ta'ala an also used to do the adhan. There used to be two adhans in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One used to be the adhan for tahajjud salah. The other adhan used to be the adhan that it's time for fajr, now everyone should be fasting. So in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the Sahaba Radwanullahi Ta'ala alayhim ajma'een that listen, there are two adhans that are happening, but فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ كُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يُؤَذِّنَا إِبْنُ أُمْ مَكْتُوم that start fasting when Ibn Umm Maktoum radiallahu ta'ala an says the adhan. Why? Because Bilal radiallahu ta'ala an or Ibn Maktoum radiallahu ta'ala an doesn't give the adhan until, the, until dawn has set, until it is time to fast. The Mufassirin, the Muhaddithin, the jurists of Islam, they look at this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they tell us that a person who hears the Adhan of Fajr Salah, he might look at this hadith and say, wait, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Bilal Radiallahu Ta'ala gives the Adhan, even though it might be for Fajr. 
And he'll look at this hadith and say that, you know, this tells us that we could eat a little after the, after the adhan. But the hadith is real clear in this matter. The hadith, this same hadith is telling us, فَإِنَّهُ لَا يُؤَذِّنُ حَتَّى يَطْلُعُ الْفَجْرِ That don't go with the adhan of Bilal radiallahu ta'ala an, but go with the adhan of Ibn Umm Maktoum radiallahu ta'ala an, because Ibn Umm Maktoum radiallahu ta'ala an is the one who gives the adhan at the appropriate time. So that's why a person, once we hear the adhan, if we're sitting in the masjid, we happen to do our suhoor in the masjid, then once we hear the adhan, we cannot eat after that because the time has already come in for us to start our fast. And many people might think that looking at this hadith that a person can eat after, but the hadith itself is very clear in this matter that once the adhan comes and dawn has set, then a person could not, uh, should not eat. And if a person does eat knowingly that the time has already come in, then his fast is invalid. But keeping in mind that the Qur'an ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions is for people who know astronomy and who know For people who know how to distinct between what time and between how to uh, distinct between the timings of just by looking at the day and the sunlight and people who don't really have to look at how, what time it is. For people like us, I know one time I was traveling to North Carolina, this was maybe three weeks back, and we were traveling and it was also the time Salah came, it was a, almost about to be over, we had maybe 30 minutes left. And because we were traveling, so we delayed it a bit, but we, it was getting a bit too late. So we pulled over to a gas station. And when we pulled over to this gas station, we got out of the car and we didn't have the service. You know, T-Mobile, Allahu Akbar, their service is great. So when we came to this gas station, it's in the middle of nowhere, a bunch of trees around us. I get out of the car, my friend gets out, and we start looking at each other. <laughs> we're like, which way is the qibla? We can't really tell by the sun because we're not used to it. <laughs> so we're just looking at, standing there looking at each other. And then alhamdulillah we were able to figure out which way the qibla was to pray Salatul Asr. But we are so used to looking at the time and we're not able to do it like the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the Sahaba Ridwanullahi Ta'ala Alayhim Ajma'in did. So for us, sticking to the charts which are exact on time on when we should uh, break our fast and when we should open our fast, we have to stick to those. And if not, a few minutes, maybe a minute or two earlier. Because these clocks aren't exact, the timings aren't exact. The Prophet ﷺ, we will go over th some, uh, through some ahadith, which will tell us that a person should, uh, when he's eating suhoor, he should delay it as much as possible. And when he is doing iftar, he should uh, hurry up and be as hasty as he can while he's breaking his fast. But this is, remember, when a person can truly distinct between what the timings are and just by looking at the sun and just by looking at it uh, said he's able to tell if a person for, uh, such as ourselves we can't really do this so a person can maybe wait and uh, start fasting a minute early and break his fast maybe 30 seconds or a minute late so that way we are right on time going on with the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the first hadith which is mentioned over here Narrated by Amr ibn al-As radiallahu ta'ala an, he says that the Prophet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam telling us the value and virtue of suhoor and the breakfast that we do before starting our fast. He says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna fasl siyamina wa siyami ahli al-kitab ma bayna siyamina wa siyami ahli al-kitab aklatu suhoor. That the distinction between our fast when we keep fast and the fast of the ahli al-kitab, the people of the book, the Christians and the Jews, is that before we start fasting, we start making suhoor. We eat our breakfast because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put barakah in it and blessings in it like how in the hadith will be mentioned. Some of us will we have the habit because, you know, all the way in Kentucky, the timings for Fajr are coming at 425 around or maybe 423. So some of us might make the habit of right after we pray our Isha Salah, maybe wait till 1130, 12, we'll eat our breakfast then, call it our suhoor, and then we'll go to sleep and wake up for Fajr Salah. But this is not the actual meaning of what suhoor is. Suhoor is the meal at the last portion of the night. And this is what we have to make a habit of in the month of Ramadan. The nights will be very short. And some of us might get lazy and shaitan might come to us or this will just come to us ourselves, the, this feeling that you know, maybe I should do my suhoor before I go to sleep and then I can w easily wake up for Fajr Salah and go pray Fajr inshallah at the masjid. But 
the true meaning of suhoor is a person who does his sahri and who does his breakfast right at the last portion of night, right before the fajr time comes in. And then in the next hadith, narrated by Sahih ibn Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala an, he says, كُنْتُ أَتَسَحَرُ فِي أَهْلِ ثُمَّ تَكُونُ سُرَعَةِ أَنَدْرُكَ السُّجُودِ مَعَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ أَيْ صَلَاةَ الْفَجْرِ He says, and a very great habit that many of us should acquire in the month of Ramadan, that you know, we might live 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes away from the masjid, but it's especially in this month of Ramadan, when the time comes in, when we do our suhoor, we should keep in mind that we should try to make our salah in the masjid, our fajr salah in the masjid. So if the masjid is maybe 30 minutes away from my house, I should leave 30 minutes or maybe even 40 minutes earlier so that way I can come to the masjid and pray with the Prophet sallallahu uh, pray in the masjid with, uh, like how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us to, just like how the Sahabi who had this, you know, he, who had this encouragement and who really wanted to, who had this struggle and zeal to come to the masjid to pray for your salah with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Obviously, we cannot pray with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but definitely we can pray the way the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us to and would have definitely wanted us to pray. In the next hadith, narrated by Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an, he says that, inna ma'ashar al-anbiya, that we are the group and the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of the Anbiya alayhi wa salatu wa salam. He says, umirna an nu'ajjila fitrana, in many of the books, or if not all, it will be an naj'ala, it's actually an nu'ajjila. The correct way of it uh, being written is an nu'ajjila fitrana, wa an nu'akhira suhoorana, wa an nada'a aymanana ala shama'ilina fi salah. That Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an says, again telling us that how we should hasten when it's come time for iftar and we should delay as much as possible when we are doing our suhoor. That he says that we are the companions of the, anbiya, of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Anbiya. We have been ordered to hasten while we are breaking our fast. When time comes for Maghrib salah, do not delay. And do not be amongst those people who say, you know, the timings are so wrong, maybe we should delay five minutes. Or people who will go outside, who've never learned astronomy, who've never learned anything about the skies and the sun and the moon, they'll come outside the masjid and they'll say, there's still some sunlight, I'm going to wait, I'm going to delay my iftar until the sun goes completely down and it's completely dark. You know, many of us, if we study astronomy, you'll notice that when it's, cl when it's a cloudy weather and there is, the sun is out on the other side of the world and the rays are still out of the sun, it's going to hit the skies which are above us and it's going to cause some lights to, to still be there. But a person who doesn't study astronomy or who doesn't study this minute level of this field and he looks at the sun and he sees that the rays of the sky of the sun are still out, he will say it's not time to break if thought. Right? But that's not our field. We haven't studied it, so we cannot be the ones to judge if it's if thought time or not. For us, all we have to do is find a reliable, accurate, a reliable time which will tell us that the sun is being set at this time. We delay maybe a minute and then we make our iftar. And do not delay five, ten minutes saying that the sunlight is still out. Because that is not our job. We are not masters of that field. So Ibn Abbas is saying that we used to hasten when we used to do our iftar. And that we have been told that when we do our suhoor, do it at a later time. And do it at the time that the Prophet has told us to. That the Prophet, uh, the Sahabi, uh, Sahib ibn Sa'ad, in the previous page, he told us that I used to do my, do my suhoor. And it was at such a time that I used to do my suhoor and I used to hasten to the Prophet so that I could pray salah with the Prophet Telling us how we should delay it as much as possible, looking at the time, being very careful with that while we do our suhoor. And same thing with our iftar, that we should hasten as much as possible, looking at the time and being on the safe side. And then Ibn Abbas says, Then when we are praying salah, that our right hand should be on our left hand when we are holding it in salah. That's what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the uh, Sahaba radwanullahi ta'ala anhim ajma'in and that is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the next hadith narrated by Ibn Habban, narrated in, in Ibn Habban, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna al mutasahirin Truly showing us the kind of virtue Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have placed in this in this time of suhoor, in this time of doing breakfast for us when we are going to fast throughout the day, have something in the morning. Have something which will keep you running and inshallah it will be sufficient for you to go till uh, far time. 
But you should always have this habit and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Verily Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and His angels send blessings on those who eat before dawn, meaning who do suhoor. And this is a very blessed time for us to do our suhoor and even pray maybe two rakats to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala because obviously the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also had this habit. In the last one-third portion of the night, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to stand up and pray to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So when we get up for suhoor, first thing we should do is make wudu, pray two rakats, and then do our suhoor, and then maybe pray another two rakats, and then at the time, right before uh, suhoor time is over, we should have a drink of water or something to keep us dehydrated, dehydrated, throughout, the whole, uh, hydrated throughout the whole day. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam going on, this was just the virtues of eating suhoor, going on to the virtues of eating iftar, narrated by Sahib ibn Sa'd ta'ala, and again he says that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam قال, لا يزال الناس بخير, بخير ما عجل الفطرة that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the people will continuously be in benefit and will be in some good ما عجل الفطر as long as they hasten in doing their iftar now look at what the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling us just by doing iftar on its appropriate time we will be on khayr we will be on some good Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will continuously bless us Look at the reason behind this. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knows that at, time, at the time of iftar, especially when the days are very hot, a person is continuously working. This person, when the time of iftar comes, he's going to grab that, uh, grab that date and he's going to grab that uh, glass of water. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling us a virtue that we're going to do this anyways. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is bringing an uh, Islamic uh, aspect in this also by telling us that by doing whatever you were going to do anyways, whatever you wanted to do anyways, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are putting blessings and there's going to be khayr in whatever you do. And another way to look at this hadith, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us that whenever we do, uh, we hasten in our iftar, and as long as we keep hastening in our iftar, we will be on khayr. Another reason to look at this is because it is a commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to hasten with our iftar. And when we are fulfilling this by hastening in iftar and doing iftar at its appropriate time, we are fulfilling and going, uh, obeying the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And obviously when a person does exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, does exactly what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us to, this person is obviously going to be in khayr. This person is obviously going to be in blessings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As the Qur'an ayah is mentioned, قُلْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحَبَبْكُمُ اللَّهِ Now if you, come, if you say that you love Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is being told to tell the Sahaba that, O oh, Sahaba, love me, love me as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will love you. And truly if we do this, with keeping this intention in mind that we are doing iftar and it's appropriate time, we are hastening with iftar for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because it is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Then definitely Allah subhanahu wa taala and the love of Allah subhanahu wa taala will definitely come. In the next hadith, narrated by Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu taala an, he says, "Kan al Nabiyyu sallallahu alaihi wasallam yufliru qabla an yusalli ala ala rutubatin." فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ رُطُوبَاتٌ فَتُمَيْرَاتٌ فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تُمَيْرَاتٌ حَسَى حَسَوَاتٌ مِّنْ مَا He says, narrated by Anas ibn Malik رضي الله تعالى عنه, he reports that the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم would break his fast with a few fresh dates before offering salah. And obviously when a person, when time comes from Maghrib, the adhan happens first, and then there's given some time for a person, as soon as the adhan goes off, Many of us will start eating our dates, we'll start eating our fruits, we'll start drinking our milk, whatever it might be. And then we will go on and then pray our salah. Now again, it's already there, we're already going to do this. This is already our nature that this is what we want to do. If we just have the intention of following the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we will be doing our iftar, fulfilling our desires by eating and drinking, and at the same time, we will be being, uh, being rewarded for following the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Subhanallah, verily the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was truthful when he said ad-deenu yusran, that the deen that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the way of life Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has chosen for us and given us is truly very easy. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala truly give us the understanding. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would break his fast with a few fresh dates before offering salah. 
And if fresh dates were not readily available, if they weren't available to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would break it on any dry date. He would just find any dry dates. Usually, obviously we know at the time of a walima, a person's, or even a nikah, we see those uh, dry dates being thrown usually at one another. And those are the dates that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that if the fresh dates weren't available, then those hard dates that the, uh, used to be the ones that used to be taken by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to break its fast. And if the condition was such for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then the Prophet Sallallahu, where he couldn't even have that, then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if the dry dates were not available, he would drink a few sips of water. And that's how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to break his fast. And truly just understanding how the fast of the Sahaba and the Prophet ﷺ was, was truly nothing compared to what our fast is nowadays and what the Prophet ﷺ was. One incident comes to mind about Sayyidina Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha and Zubair radiallahu ta'ala an. She says that one time my husband Zubair radiallahu ta'ala an, he goes out with the Prophet ﷺ and at that time I was expecting a child who later on, she's narrating the story, and she's saying that at that time I was expecting a child, and that child who later on became what well, ended up being my daughter, whose name ended up being Khadija. So she said, I was pregnant at that time, and I had a neighbor, Kanat Lana Jaru Min Al Yahud. I had a Jewish neighbor, and this neighbor of mine at that time my condition was such, and only a person can truly understand who is a married person who had a child can understand what kind of cravings a lady goes through at the time of pregnancy. And such state was the state of, I believe it was Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha. And she says that this was my condition. I was very hungry. I was starving. And she says, my neighbors, my Jewish neighbors, they had a goat. So they slaughtered that goat, they roasted it, they made it nice, and then she says, I smelt the fragrance of that goat right away. So when Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha smelt that nice, fresh goat being roasted, subhanAllah, such, such temptations came to her mind, obviously being so hungry, and on top of that being pregnant with the daughter, so Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha came to her mind. She says that, you know, maybe I should go to my neighbors. And I should make some excuse that I need some fire. Just making some excuse that I need some fire or I need to borrow some wood. And just out of common courtesy, the food is ready at their house. She might offer me a plate. So this thought comes to Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha. And she says, okay, so I'll do this. She went to the neighbor's house. She knocked on the door. The neighbor opened and asked, how may I help you? She said, I needed to borrow some wood for fire. So she gave her some pieces of wood and the fire was lit on it. So, and, but no uh, courtesy was extended to her. So Asma radiallahu ta'ala had returned home and she's very disappointed and very upset that, you know, my neighbors didn't, out of courtesy, didn't give me this food, didn't give me this plate of food. So Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha, you know, she started crying. And then she says, you know, maybe I can make another excuse. And subhanAllah, at that time of, you know, when you really need something, the weirdest thought comes to a person's mind. And the, you'll imagine the most weirdest things and at, later on when you are in a better situation, you'll think of that time and be like, SubhanAllah, I can't believe I made that suggestion to her. I can't believe I did such and such thing at this time. So Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha was in a similar condition. She said, you know, I can go make another excuse and say that the fire went out. The fire went out. And I can go again and ask her again. So Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha goes back to the neighbor's door. She knocks again. The neighbor asks, yes, how may I help you? She says, I needed to borrow some fire again. The fire went out. So the neighbor again, she's like, no problem. No, we just made some nice goat. We have the fire. You can have some fire. <laughs> so Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha takes the fire. <laughs> and again, out of courtesy, no food was given. Out of the courtesy that she was expecting, it wasn't extended to her and she was given no food. So Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha says she comes home. I fell down, she says, and I started crying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I started crying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Oh Allah, it is only you who can help me now. I leave myself for you, Oh Allah, whatever you want to do, it's up to you now. If I'm to die today, then I am happy with that. And if you are going to give me food, then I am happy with that also. And who wouldn't be? So, 
the husband of that Jewish neighbor comes home and he sees the food is ready, you know, just waiting to grub. And this person then asks that, did someone come to our house in the meanwhile while you were cooking? She says, yes, our Arab lady, our Arab neighbor, she lives next door. She came to our house two times and she asked for some fire, so I gave her some fire, exactly what she wanted. So subhanAllah, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in this person's heart. This person takes an oath and he says, that I will not eat a morsel of food from what you have made until you give a plate to that neighbor that came out to our house two times. SubhanAllah, such ways Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens for His true believers. The people who are truly God conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who have that fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they raise their hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and truly understand who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open ways for them. As how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا A person who acquires this fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises not one door, not two doors, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says مَخْرَجًا Many ways Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open for this person. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly give us that kind of God-fearing heart and God-consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the dua for iftar. Many du'as have been narrated in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and there was no exact or specific one that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had a habit of saying every single time the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam broke his fast. Many hadith have narrated many different du'as, and if a person makes a ha memorizes one, two, or even three of those du'as and reads those every single day, inshallah he will give the bar he will get the uh, barakat and blessings that Allah subhanahu wa taala has blessed blessed a, a person by reading those du'as. One dua that has been narrated in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أفطر قال ذهب الضمأ وبتلت العروق وثبت الأجر إن شاء الله Narrated in Abu Dawood that he says when a person breaks his fast or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to, when he used to break his fast and open his fast he used to read this dua that ذهب الضمأ that truly the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say the thirst has been removed. You know, a person working all day long, especially in the summer that's coming up for us, the Prophet ﷺ used to break his fast, get us a drink of water, and used to say, that the thirst has been removed, the veins have been moistened, and وَثَبَتَ الْأَجْرُ Allah ta'ala, And the reward has been established by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another dua that has been narrated in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, كَانَ إِذَا أَفْطَرَ قَالْ اللَّهُمَّ لَكَ صُمْتُ وَعَلَىٰ رِزْقِكَ أَفْطَرَتُ That, O oh Allah, I have fasted for your sake, and I break my fast with your provisions. And these are two du'as and many, obviously there are others in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inshallah any du'a that we read that has been narrated in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inshallah we will get the reward also. Moving on to the next section is the fiqh of Ramadan. And understanding what the meaning of sawm is and understanding what kind of fast we do in the month of Ramadan. The literal and legal definition of fasting and sawm. Fasting and sawm in the Arabic language literally means if you open the dictionary, it will tell you this meaning to refrain from anything. doesn't matter what it may be. Like in the time of Maryam alayhi salatu was salam, as mentioned in the Qur'an, for her refraining, as mentioned in the Qur'an, she says, إِنِّي صَوْمًا فَلَنْ أُكَلِّمَ الْيَوْمَ إِنْسِيَا She says, I have made a promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I will fast, I will refrain. And what was their fasting and what was their refraining? that she will not talk to anyone. And that was the fast and that was the refraining that was in the time of Maryam alayhi salatu was salam. And for us in our Sharia and in our Islamic law, it is totally different. In Sharia, in Sharia the word fasting, salam, is, to, is total abstinence, uh, abstinence from any food, drinks, and, material, uh, and marital relations, meaning sexual intercourse from dawn till sunset with the intention of fasting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And obviously the different types of fasts are there. Types of fasts, fold and mu'ayyan. There's only one fast which has been made followed by, the, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is mentioned in the Quran, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَالْيَصُمْ That whoever is present on this day has the health of fasting and has the ability to fast, then this person must fast because it is made obligated by Allah subhanahu, obligatory by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there's fold غَيْرْ mu'ayyan. There are fasts which are, are uh, obligated upon us, which are those fasts 
that we might have missed in the month of Ramadan. So now we have to make these up if we are ever given the ability in our lifetime. And then inshallah we'll continue the small uh, next portion inshallah after salah. Inshallah, if brothers need to make wudu or get ready for salah, they can do so now. Salah will be at 6.45 inshallah. Jazakum Allah khair. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <coughs> Continuing on with the fiqh of Ramadan and the types of fast that we have. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's only one on page 17 This is the types of fast that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have in our in Islam. Number one is fard al-mu'ayyin, which are the fasts which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made obligatory upon each and every single Muslim who is aqil, intel intelligent, who is baligh, who has passed puberty, who has to fast. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْ This person, whoever ha faces or is present during this month of Ramadan, he has to fast in this month of Ramadan. And then is fard ghayr mu'ayyin, these are fasts which are compulsory upon a person to make up, but there's not a specific date when, or day when this person has to make it up. For example, the fasts a person might miss because of due to illness or sickness, that a person skips a fast in the month of Ramadan, so this person can make this up whenever he wants as, as to his comfort. And then, like how the Quran says, وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا on page 18, وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَامٍ أُخْرَىٰ on page 17 on this. And then, Allah sub and then we have the fast which are wajib. Now wajib means compulsory and this is compulsory from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fard is that which is compulsory through the Quran and the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And fard mu'ayyin is that which is told to us by the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encouraged and made actually to an extent compulsory for us to fast. And you, there are two types. There's mu'ayyan, wajib mu'ayyan, and wajib ghair mu'ayyan. Wajib mu'ayyan is an example, if a person knows the Arabic language, you will understand right away that it's compulsory. And mu'ayyan, it's specified. For example, when I take an oath that if I pass my exams, I'm going to fast on the day, uh, on Thursday, on this upcoming Thursday. So when now, when a person passes his exam, he makes this another and he makes this oath to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Oh Allah, if I pass my exams on Monday, I'm going to fast on Thursday. So now when it happens that, yes, you passed on Monday, then now you have to fast. It's compulsory and wajib for you to fast on that Thursday. And now another example of this would be of, of ghayr mu'ayyan. It's compulsory, wajib, but it's not specified. It's ghayr mu'ayyan. You say, if I pass my exam on Monday, I will fast. You don't specify what date that is. You can, specify, you can do it whenever you want. You didn't specify Thursday for it. Thursday would be wajib mu'ayyan. Wajib ghayr mu'ayyan is that you say that I will fast for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if I pass on Monday. You pass on Monday, now whatever day you get, you, have, uh, you should fast on that day. That's the third type. Fourth type is sunnah. Those acts or those fasts which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kept himself on certain days and those fasts which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encouraged. The, uh, one of those days would be the 10th of Muharram in which Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, كان رسول الله on page 18 كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يأمر بصيامه قبل أن يفرض رمضان before the obligation of Ramadan came into practice the fasting of the 10th of Muharram was there فلما فرض رمضان and when the obligation of Ramadan came into place كان من شاء صام يوم عاشوراء then whoever wanted to fast on the يوم عاشوراء on the 10th of Muharram he used to fast ومن شاء أفطر and if a person didn't feel like fasting on this day a person didn't fast from the Sahaba رضوان الله تعالى عليهم أجمعين and now look at the note on page 18 it is written that it is preferred to either fast one day before or one day after the 10th of Muharram and now the reason why the author wrote this is because the Jews in their times, they used to also fast on the 10th of Muharram. And we as Muslims, whatever was in the previous religions, we took that unless the Prophet ﷺ said, no, we're not going to take this. So the 10th of Muharram was there for the Jews, so the Prophet ﷺ kept it for the Muslims also. But when the Prophet ﷺ the Ramadan came, then the Prophet ﷺ didn't really encourage a person to keep this fast. And now when this in the note when it is said that it's preferred to fast one day before or one day after, it is saying that because so we are not 
following and in the same and doing mutashabe or being in the same doing the same thing that the Jews are, were doing. That's why we should either fast one day before or one day after. But this was only when the Jews and the Muslims had the same lunar calendar. Nowadays, our calendar is different and the Jews' calendar is different. For our tenth of Muharram, the Jews will not fast. Because our tenth of Muharram and their tenth of Muharram are two different days. So nowadays, the ulama have said and the fuqaha and the Jewish have said that if a person fasts just on the tenth of Muharram, it is fine, but there might be some karahat and it might be disliked a bit. There, it might be a bit of makruh. But if a person obviously puts another day with it, either before or after, then it will be completely fine. And then the fast of Mondays and Thursdays, which has been proven by the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. As Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says on page 18, and Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يتحري صيام الاثنين والخميس That the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would strive to fast يوم صيام الاثنين, اثنين in the Arabic language is Monday, and خميس is Thursday, which is the uh, sunnah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, that he used to fast every Monday and Thursday, or at least used to try. And another sunnah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is وَقَالَ فِيهِمَا ذَانِكَ يَوْمَانِ تُعْرَضُ فِيهِمَ الْأَعْمَالُ عَلَى رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ the Prophet ﷺ states his reason why he fasts on Monday and Thursday. On page 19, the Prophet ﷺ, or page 18 for the other books, he says that the reason I do this is because these are two days wherein deeds are presented to the Lord of the worlds, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet ﷺ says, I want my deeds to be presented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while I am fasting and doing another ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another type of fast is, as number five, the mustahab and desirable facts that a person can keep. All fasts besides, and a good way to understand which uh, fasts are mustahab, are just saying that any fast besides the fard, wajib, or sunnah fall under the category of mustahab. Any fast which are aside from the fard, wajib, and uh, uh, sunnah fall under the category of mustahab. Like the fasting of Dawood alayhi salatu wasalam. Dawood alayhi salatu wasalam, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam said on page 19, that the, it's the most beloved fast to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because Dawood alayhi salatu wasalam used to fast one day and not fast the other day. Fast the next day, not fast the other day. Fast one day, not fast the other day. And this is how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam is telling us that this is the most beloved fast to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obviously outside the month of Ramadan. In the month of Ramadan, the most beloved fast to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you fast all 29 or 30 days. And outside the month of Ramadan, fast one day and not the other day on the days which is permissible for us to fast. Number six are those reprehensible, fa are reprehensible fasts, meaning fasting only on Friday or Saturday. If a person says that, you know, Friday is such a nice day, such a virtuous day, such a good day for the Muslims, I'm going to fast on this day. This is makru and dislike because this person is giving the day of Friday, some extra importance than the other days of the week. Or if a person says, I'm only going to fast on Saturday. You're giving extra importance to this one day and saying that I'm only going to fast on Friday because of whatever, you know, I think it's a very good day and very great day. Then this is not, uh, this is disliked and not dis, uh, desirable. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in a hadith himself, that on page 19, لا يصوم أحدكم Where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, لا يصوم أحدكم يوم الجمعة إلا أن يصوم قبله أو يوم بعد أو بعده. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, do not just fast on the day of Friday, but rather fast one day before it or one day after it. And in the same way, the next, in the next hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentions, and I think the translation is off on this, so inshallah we'll do the translation, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says on page 19, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا تصوموا يوم السبت إلا مفتولضا عليكم. Do not fast on the day of Saturday except that which has been made obligatory upon you. And a good way to understand this is that, for example, a person says, if I pass my exam on Monday, I will fast on the 16th. You pass your exam on Monday, the 16th ends up being a Saturday. So it is permissible for a person to fast on this day because he did not actually appoint that day himself. It was a day that it, ended, it was the 16th and it ended up being a Saturday. You're not giving it any extra fazilat or virtue up upon the other days. 
So do not fast on the day of Saturday except that which has been made obligatory upon you. وَإِن لَمْ يَجِدْ أَحَدُكُمْ إِلَّا لِحَاءَ عَيْنَبَةٍ أَوْ عُودَ شَجَرَةٍ فَلْيَمْضَغْهُ And if you do happen to fast on that day, then if, it, if one of you does not find, or if one of you finds a bark of a grape, لِحَاءَ عَيْنَبَةٍ A bark of a grape, or أَوْ عُودَ شَجَرَةٍ A branch of a tree, then you should take that and put it in your mouth and break your fast because you are not supposed to be fasting on the day of Saturday by just giving it any extra virtue upon the other days of the week. Because it is not proven to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Note, fasting only on Friday or Saturday with the belief that those days are more, that those days are more virtuous than the rest of the week is obviously disliked. And that is what it's referring to in this book. The next type of fast that a person might keep which he shouldn't is a haram fast. A person fasting on the days which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have told us not to fast. For example, it is haram to fast on five days during the year. These five days are Eid al-Fitr, the Eid which after Ramadan on the first of Shawwal, Eid al-Adha on the 10th of Dhul-Hijjah, and three days after Eid al-Adha, meaning 11, 12, and 13. It is, it is haram. A person will get sin for fasting on these days. Like how the Aisha radiallahu ta'ala has said in the hadith, and Aisha radiallahu ta'ala has said, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala has said, Naha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is on top, on top of page 20, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade us and, forbid us and prohibited us from fasting on two days. So main. Two days you cannot fast. Yawm al-Fitr wa yawm al-Adha. On Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. And then in the next hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, or Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhumah says, that lam yurakhas fi ayyam al-Tashriq an yasunna illa liman yajid al-Hadiyya. That it is not permissible, it is not permitted for anyone to fast on the days of Tashriq except for he who does Hajj and does not have an animal to slaughter. When we go for Hajj, we obviously, after we do the a'mal and af'al of hajj, we have to slaughter an animal. But if a person doesn't have the necessi necessary means to do so, then this person will ob cannot uh, slaughter an animal. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obviously made a way out for him, and he's just going to fast. And then in the next hadith, uh, with the same meaning, that narrated by Abu Murrah Mawla Ummahani, أَنَّهُ دَخَلَ مَعَ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ بْنِ عَمَرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَلَىٰ أَبِيهِ عَبْنَ عَبْنِ عَصَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنَىٰ That one time, Amr ibn al-As went to Abu Murrah came to Amr ibn Asa radiallahu ta'ala an with Abdullah ibn Amr radiallahu ta'ala an. So Amr radiallahu ta'ala an presented some food for them. He presented some food for them just out of courtesy. And Abu, Mur Abu Murrah radiallahu ta'ala said that I am fasting. So when the two sahabi heard this that he's fasting on these days, he says, Amr radiallahu ta'ala an said, eat. For these are the days in which the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited us from fasting. And then Imam Malik radiallahu ta'ala an said, these were the days of tashriq, looking at the other ahadith, because we have seen that it is not permissible, haram rather, to fast on these five days. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to truly understand the value of the month of Ramadan and truly give us the ability to use this month of Ramadan to its fullest. Jazakumullahu khair. Wa akhiru da'wana. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.